So thank you. Thank you for joining us for Science Pub Bing. This is a monthly lecture series exploring the exciting world around us. And what is better than science? <laughs> I'm Nancy Coddington. I am the director of science content for WSKG Public Media. I'm one of the co-founders of Science Pub, and I'm also your host for this evening. I would like to introduce the other founder of Science Pub, Christine Kieswer. She is going to be behind the scenes this evening, fielding your questions from the chat and the Q&A section. So please make sure you get your questions in there for her. I would like to also introduce a special guest with us this evening. We have Jessica Waugh. She is the Associate Professor of Biological Sciences at Binghamton University. Welcome, Jess. Mm -hmm. And Jess is going to be our host actually for next month. So we're really excited to have her here with us this evening. So thank you. We have with us our science intern, Julia Diana. She is an, a student at Binghamton University and she's going to be live tweeting the event. So you can follow that conversation on Twitter using the hashtag WSKG SciPub. And Julia is gonna pop that in the chat so that you can follow that conversation if you like to do multiple things and tweet at the same time. And I think that's all our housekeeping. So tonight's talk is architecture plus the 21st century paradigm shift, designing for the subliminal brain. So what do you feel when you look at a majestic cathedral or maybe an imposing skyscraper or an ultra modern museum? Why do you feel anything at all? So tonight we are going to look at how the built environment impacts all of us and even reframes the history of modern architecture. We'll explore new scientific findings in human perception, the role of empathy in architecture and more. I'm super excited for this evening's talk. Our speaker this evening is Ann Sussman. She is an architect, an author, and researcher who is passionate about understanding how buildings influence people emotionally. Ian is president of the Human and Arch Architecture and Planning Institute, Inc., the hapi.org. And we're going to pop that link into the, the chat for you so you can follow that and find more information. It's a nonprofit devoted to improving the design of the built environment through education and research. Her book, Cognitive Architecture Designing for How We Respond to the Built Environment, won the 2016 Place Research Award for the Environmental Design Research Association. And very exciting for Anne, the second edition of that book, Cognitive Architect, is coming out this July. So you have been very busy during the past uh, year with the pandemic that's going on. So I would like to give a very warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Anne Sussman. Anne? Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is just amazing. Thank you for reaching out and thank you for caring about science. What the pandemic has really taught us is science really matters and science involves all of us. Should I share my screen? Yes, please go ahead and share your screen at this time. Okay, here we go. Does everybody see it? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so the title of the talk is Architecture of the 21st Century Paradigm Shift designing for the subliminal brain. And in talking with Nancy earlier, if you have any questions or want to say anything, please do speak up or uh, because we want to make this an interactive um, presentation as we can over Zoom. And what we're going to be talking about is how we're really in incredibly amazing times. Um, we're in what's called a 21st century paradigm shift. It's not just a pandemic, it's the actual paradigm shift. We're in this new time where, believe it or not, our 21st century is now called a new age, an age of biology. I was born in and went to school in the 20th century, the age of chemistry and physics. My dad was a chemical engineer. And the 19th century is the age of engineering. And that gave us amazing things like the Eiffel Tower. I actually stole this idea from the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And they, uh, Professor Ann Glover, who is a female knight, she's the dame of a British empire, that's a CBE. She's a biologist and she came up with this idea that the 21st century is a new age, the age of biology. And she explained it this way. And I um, used her slides because they're so good. So the 19th century gave us engineering, uh, gave us, you know, a camera, trains, 
uh, the Eiffel Tower. The 20th century, look at this, we got radar, we got plastics. I mean, we live surrounded by plastics so much we can't imagine there was a time when there wasn't plastics. Um, we got the first computer. Uh, we split the atom. They were game-changing things. They changed what people could do. They changed how they lived. But now, what the OECD is saying is we're in a completely new time. And they're calling it the age of biology. And now we can see things from the inside out. <coughs> Excuse me. Does anyone know what this, the top slide is on the left, the top picture on the left is? <coughs> can you answer? Or, or the picture on the right? The top picture on the left is, yes, Paul um, has indicated that that is DNA and I agree with him and Adam. <laughs> that is right, and what's below? Uh, right below that looks like that's gonna be a neuron. Those are neurons, and how many neurons do you have? A lot. A lot, <laughs> 80, to 100, uh, 80 to 100 billion. And so in a way, that's the amazing thing about the 21st century, we see the world, um, inside out, whereas the 20th century gave us all this engineering, now we can kind of under, understand ourselves differently. And we can do completely different things, like Oscar Satoris, even though he was a double amputee, could make the Olympics. I mean, that's unheard of. In the 20th century, if you were an amputee, you didn't go to the Olympics. It, things just, it just shifts how you think. And it's gonna be very profound for many disciplines. And one of the disciplines that's gonna change the most, I'm going to argue in this lecture, is architecture. Because now we can use these amazing new tools and actually look at how build people experience buildings. Let me show you this. So what you're seeing is this woman looking at a famous building. It's Villa Rotunda. It's in Northern Italy. It's by Palladio, one of the most famous buildings in the world in a way because it includes so much other architecture. It was the basis in some ways for an elevation of the White House that's on every $20 bill. And now you can take that building that was built like 400 years ago, and you can look at how people actually look at it. So every one of those big circles is called fixations. That's where the stimuli is coming into the brain. And the line between them is saccades. And like the woman looking at this doesn't realize she's moving her eyes 45 times in 15 seconds. But in the new age of biology that we're in, I do, and I can actually see how she's looking at things before she consciously realize, without her, even though she doesn't consciously realize it. And what you can do is, um, you can also see that everybody looks at the world a little differently. So here's another woman looking at it. You can see she's looking at it slightly differently. And so what the big companies do that are really interested in selling things to human beings, they will do statistical averages. They'll get 30 to 39 people to look at this image and they'll figure out where they look first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth in the first 15 seconds or in the first minute. It's quite amazing. They, do, they look for the TTFF, that's the time to first fixation. And we can see, and they can, again, they can actually find how long most people, in this case, 32 people looked at this. They can see, oh, well, let's see, 30 people found the first um, fixation in a certain number of seconds. It's quite, quite amazing. And you also can see how people look at the world with some differences, but with a lot of similarities. And what's kind of amazing about this building is what people really focus on in this building, believe it or not, is all the statues. They do look at the center, they look at the door, and then they look at all the statues. It's quite interesting. And um, this is how you set up a lab like this. Um, this is iMotion software that I just showed you. iMotion software is used by Honda, BMW, GM. I know that because iMotion says that on their website. And this is the kind of detail, the amazing kind of detail that uh, car companies, tech companies um, use today which to really understand the human experience and design for people. They'll track brain waves. They'll do the eye tracking that you just saw. They'll track facial expression. Um, we'll talk about that a little maybe, later. Well, they'll, they'll track heart wake. They'll track galvanic skin response, how electrical charges shift on your skin immediately when you see different things. I mean, it's pretty amazing everything they follow and then they shift their design to um, better accommodate needs you don't even realize you have. 
And what you can also get, it can, it can get kind of pricey setting up a lab like this, but what you can also get is you can now get software from 3M, that's a big company, um, called, that's called Visual Attention Software, 3M VAS. And 3M VAS, you can just upload any image you want or any Photoshop drawing or any drawing you did, and it will spit out in less than 30 seconds. They will tell you algorithmically how people are predicted to look at what you sent them. And so if you want to design a building or you want to design a website, you want to know where people find the door, or where they find the to, to buy button, how quickly they find a certain element in your design, you can determine that very quickly with this 3M VAS software without setting up the lab. It's kind of amazing um, because it really shows you that we see things more like an animal than people realize, all right? Yeah, and um, so I have a question about that really quick. So do designers do mock-ups and then redesign things based on that, what the eye tracking reveals, you know, before well, building yeah, if you're cars doing, or houses? Well, so basically this, this software has just been introduced in the architecture profession. Adobe Photoshop is pretty big in architecture and a plugin for the software just happened in October. 2020. But um, yes, designers call this a spell check for their design. So if you're doing a website for WSKG and you want to see how quickly is the donate button seen, you can actually use this software, then do another design and find that the, the, the donate button will be find, found more quickly. Yes, it is used as a spell check for design in all kinds of fields, but it's new to architecture. Um, it, and it's, it's extremely powerful. A little bit scary because it shows you kind of how easy it is to manipulate people. <laughs> but yeah, any other questions do ask me. So the big theme of this talk, I mean, this is it, the cat's out of the bag, uh, is, is basically in the 21st century, as part of this 21st century paradigm shift, you're designing for the unconscious brain. Because now we have these biotech tools which allow us to completely see the unconscious. It's incredible. Just like you can see those 45 little uh, fixation dots I just showed you a couple minutes ago, you can see all kinds of other things as well to design for the human body that most people don't even realize they have. And that's what they're doing today. It's kind of amazing. Now, Freud was this uh, famous you know, psychologist. He had this quote, the mind is like an iceberg. It floats with one seventh of its bulk above water. That's basically the idea. Freud saw, he didn't have the biotech world we have today, but he saw after interviewing hundreds of people that often people don't understand what's driving them, that their unconscious brain was driving them in ways they don't understand. And conscious activity sits on unconscious behavior. Um, and, um, but so actually, this is really funny. It's, Freud was a little bit wrong though. Freud says, you know, 14% of our life is conscious. What we now say is 5% or less. Most of our brain activity is unconscious. 90% of brain activity is beyond our conscious awareness. And really 5% or less of what we're actually thinking, feeling, doing is conscious. And, and what's funny, that first quote I took from a website design, um, you know, a, a website that, that's for designing websites. They're already actively using this brain science in telling people how to design websites. The bigger idea, another way to say it is all of our conscious thoughts and actions are unconscious first. That's adapted from Eric Kandel in a book I'll talk about later in the talk. It's basically understanding it's all about designing for the subliminal brain, which until recently, most people never kind of intuited they had, but you couldn't get the hard data on it. Now you can get the hard data on it. Okay, and it could, I don't want to get in too much in the weeds here, but the weeds are kind of cool. It turns out the human body sends 11 million bits, a bit is a unit of information, per second to the brain. So every second when you're up, the brain is sending 11 million bits per second to the brain for processing, but the conscious mind can only handle 50 bits per second. You see the problem? So do you understand why Honda, BMW, and GM are designing for the unconscious brain? Because that's directing you, get it? It's pretty do. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. It's pretty incredible. It's the, the, what the, what, what, what's incredible is how the science is accepted by the car companies and the tech companies. And a, a lot of the rest of us don't realize what's going on. Um, and but but you know, it's so interesting now, we are in a different time. In um, when I was in architecture school and took my architecture license in the 20th century, the word emotion never came up anywhere. And now you go to the, the supermarket, there'll be the science of emotions on the rack before the checkout. The science of emotions, people are talking about emotions more. Even men talk about emotions more. It's kind of interesting. And, and um, there's this famous talk by Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. It's been had 25 million views, a TED talk. 
And she says, many of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel biologically, we're feeling creatures that think. She's a really interesting woman. She's a former Harvard neuroanatomist. She got a stroke. She's a person studying the brain and she lost control of her brain. <laughs> and she was watching herself lose control. So when she gives her talk, it's quite convincing. You know? So this idea that you're emotional first, feeling visceral first, then thinking, that's a big shift. That's a huge paradigm shift. Okay, and you see it also in business schools, like this is a Harvard coop there. The business school has books on mindfulness, happiness, empathy, who knew? Now leadership is about understanding emotions and guys are studying this, amazing. <laughs> that's, that's part of the 21st century paradigm shift. Okay, so how will the age of biology reframe architecture and how we see ourselves? Um, I think I could just show you a few more slides about that that are pretty captivating. So here you can see a, um, this is a building um, that's owned by the city of New York. And actually the city of New York gave us the resources to do this study. It was recently renovated, it's a public library. And we watched this tough student look at it. We didn't tell her what to do. This is exactly what her eyes did without conscious control. That's how she looked at it. And then what we did is we Photoshopped out the windows and had a different set of 30 students look at this version. And what's really interesting What's really interesting is we didn't tell them what to do, but you notice something different? When the building, same building, do you notice the difference? What happened? His eyes doesn't go, his eyes don't go to the windows, which is interesting because when you showed me this, my eyes went to the windows because, you know, where the windows would have been because it really bothered me. <laughs> 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 yeah, well we, well, we had 30 different people look at the one on the left and 30 different people look at the one on the right. And then this is, this is individuals. Um, but what, what's really fascinating, we then aggregate the details. So we had 30 people look at the one on the left and we can actually see how people looked at the building. It's really amazing. With 2.6 seconds, they found the, where the door was. Um, it, and then the building on the right, you see what happens. 1.2 seconds, they find the door a little faster um, but what's so interesting here is they look at, 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 at 10 seconds, they're looking at the end of the building, but, but then by 12 seconds, they're looking back at the building. Whereas in the building on the left where it doesn't have windows, the brain doesn't let them look back at the building. By 12 seconds, they're looking beyond the building. They don't even know what consciously the brain's making them do. But what the brain's making them do is not attached to the building as much. So when I ask people, I've asked about 700 people this question, where would you rather wait in front of the building on the left or the building on the right? Where do you think people wanna wait? Well, the building on the right with the windows is definitely a little more eye pleasing. And so I'm gonna stand in front of that building. That's where everybody said, but they didn't know why. And I'll have an in insight because I've done the eye tracking. I know what their subliminal brain did. Their subliminal brain without their conscious awareness, it's just what Freud says, made the decision for them. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. But what if you go the other way and then you're so focused on where things should be, then they're not. What does that say? <laughs> well, you wouldn't know that. <laughs> you wouldn't know that. That's a good question. Yeah, because people didn't know. We had to have different people look at it. They didn't know there were windows there. So that's it. So, and so this is an example too, where this is an actual um, a parking garage in, in Somerville, Massachusetts. And then we had someone add some Matisse-like art where do you think people want to wait? In front of the Matisse-like art or the blank facade? I would, I would like to stand in front of the art. It's definitely, yeah, there you go. yeah. And you don't understand what your brain did, but what you can do is you can eye track it. In this case, we only eye tracked it with 10 people. And what happens, this is what's fascinating, mind blowing actually what your brain is doing. When the building doesn't have art, your brain doesn't let you look at the blankness very much. It makes you look down the street. When the building has art, you don't look down the street, you look at the art. Isn't that amazing? It's absolutely amazing. It is amazing. So we actually have a question in from our audience about that. So do advertisers use this technology? All the time, honey. If you go to business school now, like a WPI or American University, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, you will have an eye tracking lab. It's all the time. This is technology in all and in this uh, packaging design, it's everywhere. Yep. It's all used to manipulate the person because they they get it. Um, and it's a little crazy how bad it is because now they not only manipulate uh, where your eyes are going to look, they can control that by how they're designed. They also can measure like how often you smile. 
So there's technology that measures how your muscles move on your face. I can see your muscle moving now, Nancy. <laughs> Turn my camera off. <laughs> Don't do that. And, um, and what that does, this aggregates data. And we saw only four people smiled when it looked like this. But now when you go like this, you can see without, people didn't realize what their brain's making them do, but we watched them. We had 10 different people look at this one. And so three people, five of them smiled three times in, in uh, 14 seconds. Absolutely amazing. Now this is really interesting software. There are 43 different muscles on your face. Each one of them is activated when you feel different emo emotions, okay? It's called, the, the software was developed called, by a company called Facet. The uh, software was called Emotient. And um, I'll tell you the truth now, Apple bought the software and took it off the market. Of course they did. Of course they did. So, and just a just a clarification in your graph that you have, where um, you have the dips in the valleys, where is it uh, showing where people are smiling? Oh, oh, this one right here. Yeah. Oh, so that that's the number of people that smiled. So when it goes high, that's where the smiles are. Yeah. No. 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 So when it's a line graph, nobody's smiling. But if it's a uh, four people smiled on the right here. And then five people smiled three times, you see? It's, gotcha. Okay, that's, that's how it shows. It is a little confusing, but you can actually track. Um, this software was taken off the market bought by Apple um, because they don't want competitors, you're a trillion dollar company, they don't want competitors having this kind of, kind of very powerful uh, marketing tool. So, but there's another company called Affectiva that does something similar that Apple hasn't bought yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give it time. I have a quick question before we keep going um, on back to the windows for just a moment, uh, regardless of having um, you've got one that has the windows and one that doesn't have the windows. We're back yeah. another another slide. Is it because the windows um, give human scale? Is that why we're more attracted to the windows? Okay, well, we'll, we'll get into that. That's a little more complicated. Okay. Uh, but it's um, um, I think what happens is that the brain for survival the way you are is because of 3.8 billion years of survival, right? And basically areas of contrast immediately get attention. And when there's no contrast, there's nothing to look at. So the brain tells you don't go there. So the window it has incredible contrast to it, right? Yeah, it does. Thank you. And so that's what's getting you, getting your attention. And it has a light behind it as well. And so, and, and what's so interesting though, is it's not conscious. It just shows how the unconscious directs you. And this, now you understand why business school students are using this because they want to manipulate you completely. Okay, so, so basically with biometrics, you can predict and measure how people ignore blank things, how buildings make people feel and behave, how often they smile, and, and, you can, and how specific elements impact an overall design, which is really important if you're an architect. You know, if you put windows there or not, people are gonna behave differently without understanding why. So here's, I'll just go through this pretty quickly. This is in uh, Brooklyn and, um, and it was a brand new, you know, public public museum. Where do you think people will look? I'm going to see. I'm looking actually at that building in the back, but I'm also looking at the series of windows behind the cars. There you go. You're good, girl. That's exactly what happens. That's exactly what people do. They look at the building in the back. So you design. Just imagine this. The architect. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> You're really, really good, Nancy. The architect has designed for $30 million, this building for the public with public funding. It's a public museum. And where do people go when they get out and look at the car? They look at the housing behind. It's not even connected. And then they look at the fire hydrant. It's, it's stunning. Interesting. See what happens? <laughs> no, because, Why is that? Because, because, there, because people don't look at blankness. So, so I, had a, I had a GSD student at Harvard design in some windows and a friend said to me, Anne, those windows are not very well designed at all. It didn't even matter. With, when you put the windows in, the brain will not let you look as much at the, at the high rise in the back. See what happens? See how the red, isn't that interesting? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It stresses the brain to take in blank facades. So you can ask, really understand new things about how people actually look. This is another building in New York. Where do you think people will look? It's a public library built about 15 years ago. It's a public library supported by public funds supposed to serve the interests of the public. I don't know, I feel like this one's gonna be a trick question because I first, I'm going up to the light that I'm going, I go down to the entrance where it says yeah. Queens Library. And then I go along the wave of the glass. Okay, that's good. Well, good, that's not bad, not bad. Um, so this is what happens. Basically they ignore the building completely. Glass is very hard for our brain to look at. 
And so people looked at the girl doing yoga, they looked at the, the, the contrasting bus with the entrance and they looked at the faces of other people. It's pretty wild. Yeah, the, bu the bus definitely caught my the attention first. It's the area of contrast that gets your eye, right? And then here's a famous place in Boston. And what happened, it was recently changed hands, Hancock Tower, really famous. And so they put an art installation on it and people only looked at the art installation. It's really wild. So what you start to understand pretty quickly is it's nature's preset, how we look at our world. And we're really built to see people. So if you, I show you these slides really quickly. Do you know what was on the image in the previous slide? I do. <laughs> <laughs> how about our audience? How it went by pretty quick. Did anybody notice, notice what was in that slide? What, what was in this slide? Uh, Christine says there was mugs in the slide. Mugs? And... Even, did you get anything? I'll show it to you. Somebody looked away right, right, right when the slide came back up. Um, did anybody notice what was on those mugs? Mugs with faces. Yes. Yes, you got it. You got it. Mugs with and faces. So basically, when you show this, when you, if you ever want to look at the design of an Apple ad, you'll notice it has very few fonts in it. There's a reason because it takes 60,000 times longer for your brain to process a font than to process a smiling face. So, and the smiling face is processed very, very quickly. Um, so that's it. People are built to see people and that's the big deal. And that's something that this, this very famous Renaissance painter made fun of. So here you can see the face pretty easily, right? Yeah, I do. But what, how about here? Can you see it here? It's the same painting upside down. Sure, sure. It, it, so I was trying to see if I could actually see it in reverse, if there was another way, if it was coming from the, you know. You can't because yeah. <laughs> basically the, the, the way the brain has the pattern, the template for the face is right side up and you can see the upside down face, but that's called part space processing and that takes longer. Okay, that's what's so interesting about this that you immediately can see this, right? So this is the big idea. The human brain devotes more area to face recognition than the recognition of anything else. That's the really big idea. This is Eric Kandel, Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist, former professor at Columbia. And so to sell his book about neuroscientists, he puts a beautiful face of a woman on the cover. It all makes sense, right? <laughs> He's walking the walk, right? You get it? And, and so this is it. This is from Kandel. The brain reconstructs reality according to its own rules. And so that's it. Then they now they know two years ago, they did a study projecting an image of faces in for pregnant women and the fetuses they learned in the third trimester could already recognize a right side of face. It's absolutely amazing. So that's it. So big boat business. Again, they know about our subliminal brain and how we immediately respond to faces all the time. So that's why Amazon has a smile on its logo. And they also are always getting more data. So when you look on Amazon for a book, the number one thing that people click on and the Amazon book site is the human face. The number two thing is a pet face. Um, Barack Obama's new book has his face on it. Hillary Clinton's book has her face on it because subliminally that'll sell more of your book. Well, that's good to know when I go to pen my- yeah, you got, uh, You've got to have a face on it. Now the car companies study this um, and there's a Midwestern couple. You can now actually design, you can now actually buy, they're called car lashes and you can actually buy, um, you know, eyelashes and makeup for your cars. I have seen them in Boston, people wearing them. I mean, people just identify with cars as faces, right? But it's not just the car companies, it's computer scientists, the people designing robots. This was from an article about a computer scientist, from a computer scientist, because if you want to design robots for people, you have to know what people do, right? And this is what he says. The perception of faces is more critical and previously thought for how humans perceive the aesthetics of the environment and the architecture of house facades and the buildings they're surrounded by. So we're looking at them like their faces basically all the time. That's what we need to see because that's what we evolved to see. That's the big deal, right? Okay, so as an architect, this is really fascinating. It suddenly made me understand architectural history really differently. No wonder there are so many faces on medieval churches in Spain. And it makes sense because people in the Middle Ages were illiterate. They couldn't read and they want, the church was very powerful. You'd want to go to the church. You're being seen by the apostles as you walk in and subliminally you'll look up at them. And then up oh, here's an Apple store, the 12 apostles of Apple, exactly the same design. This is in Boston, 2013, the 12 apostles of Apple. What can you do? Um, because people subliminally, again, will be still attracted to the faces. And notice how the fonts are very small. Um, and then Apple also braces plot placement on what's called the endowment effect. 
because we still have a hunter-gatherer brain, simply touching a product increases our sense of ownership and compels people to buy things. That's why Apple always has everything out so you can touch it. That's what they're doing. So they're gonna have, it's, when you walk into an Apple store, what you mostly see are faces of other people looking at other technology and that makes you do the same thing. And then they always have their technology really, really easy to touch because of the way we're evolved as a mammal we are very impressed by touch. We think we can, we'll own it. Basically, to sum this up, you can take the person out of the Stone Age, but you can't take the Stone Age out of the person. That's Nigel Nicholson, a UK, UK psychologist. And so there's fantastic irony here. So what Apple is doing is they're designing, this is an Apple store five years later, exact same light layout. They're selling the most sophisticated technology, arguably in the universe, with the fact that our brain and body is still primitive. See the irony, it's pretty fantastic. And, and, and Steve Jobs has his famous quote, the broader one's understanding of the human experience, the better design we will have. He basically, he didn't say hidden experience that most people don't know about, but that's what he was talking about. All right. <laughs> so what, what all the tech people, what, all, what they're doing, what all the marketers are doing is exploiting our, our primate brains, our animal nature. So quick question, why do you think our brain unconsciously prioritizes people and faces all the time? Quick question. Well, that would be right through evolution, right? And we have, um, Ronan says, because we can relate to them. Michael says safety. Safety, and yep. How about survival? Yeah, there you go. I wouldn't want to look up into that face. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and also a baby, a human baby is the most, you know, um, is the most helpless youth on the planet, right, at birth. And so they have to be able to immediately bond to faces. So you have to be able to see faces and you have to be able to connect to faces. Um, so basically what we can see in the 20, 21st century paradigm shift, we start seeing, when you do eye tracking, you start seeing just how face biased we are. And then you also start to understand architecture differently because you realize it expresses our hidden internal brain architecture. And it also expresses not to get too much into the biology, but how much we need to be seen to be at our best and how mammals actually co-regulate. There's this idea that um, we need to see face people seeing us because we're a social species to regulate our own nervous system. Perception is relational. This man, Stephen Porges, came up with the polyvagal theory. It's the idea that mammals, unlike reptiles, really regulate their emotional states by being seen by others. And that's why, you know, bars are so important and going out to dinner is so important. And that's in one way why the pandemic was so painful. Okay. This just came to me over Twitter today, and I'm just showing it because, way, well, they're talking about how we need to, this is a a company called Create Streets out of the UK. They're trying to be build better for people. And they're showing, you know, these 18th, 19th century ways they used to build in Amsterdam, right? Well, why does it still work? Well, it looks like a face. It's easy for anyone, even if you don't speak Dutch, to feel at home there, to want to connect to that building. Um, and here's another thing, not to get too much into neuroscience, but this is a neuroscience explains to me, in architecture, decoration ornaments serve a functional utility. In other words, because of the way we evolved, we actually need windows to look like eyes and doors to be in the center like they could be a mouth. And great designers like Walt Disney actually figured this out. He made Disneyland the first one in the 50s and on California Orange Grove. And he made Disneyland Main Street with all these ornate 19th century looking facades. By 1960s, it was the most visited um, tourist destination in all of the United States. They built another Disneyland like this in Disneyland Paris in the 1990s. By 2016, it was the most visited tourist site in Europe. Okay, people need to see organized complexity. They need to see, they need to see detail. So um, I'm going to wrap the talk up soon, but I'll just quickly go on the last part. Then the question I always wanted to ask as an architecture student was, how did modern architecture happen then? Why did big buildings become so blank and faceless? And so why, this is a 19th century building in Cambridge on the left, and this is a modern building in New York on the right. You know, what happened? Why, and when you do a VAST study, you run it through the 3M VAST software, in 30 seconds, it'll show you that subliminally the brain can attach and make a memory of the building on the left, whereas on the building on the right, it looks at the fire hydrant, it looks at the book drop. Effectively, it's showing you, because it's mostly black and light blue, it's not looking at the building at all. The architect has designed a building that subliminally the brain will not let people look at, okay?
So what happened? And to answer that question just pretty quickly is you have to understand who the people who founded Mothers Architecture, they call them the fathers of modern architecture. And it turns out two of them were German, World War I veterans, Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius. And one of them was Le Corbusier. It's interesting, they all lived around the same time. And um, born in the 1880s, died in the 1960s. And so what happened when they were about 30? A, a war we don't talk about much, World War I, because of World War II. And, um, and there was a great PBS series in 2018 to commemorate the centenary of World War I, really important, and because they're trying to like, get people to understand it a little better. And there's a great quote in that, the impact of World War I is contemporary. And that is the theme at the end of this talk. The impact of World War I is contemporary. We're all living it every day. Um, and World War I, this is another amazing thing from World War I, the British government paid a 62-year-old artist, John Singer Sargent, an American, to go to the Western Front um, in, in 1917 and portray English and American soldiers fighting together, and then he painted them. And then the British government in 2018 paid for this painting to go all over America, and I saw it. Amazing. Another first tank, some World War I. Well, so what's the point? The point is there was an incredible tragic impact of World War I, including um, you know, mass death and PTSD. Um, what happens with PTSD? Well, it was so fascinating. PTSD really wasn't talked about for most of the 20th century. It didn't enter the doctor's manual, the diagnostic statistical manual that doctors use until 1980. So um, people with PTSD, they, often, they sometimes called it shell shock. They didn't really know what it was. And it wasn't until the 1990s they could actually do a scan of your brain a magnetic resonance imaging and actually look to see how the brain changes. The brain architecture gets rewired with trauma. Okay. And um, basically this is huge. This, this book came out in 2014, The Body Keeps the Score um, by this doctor here, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. And it's all about that. Um, I, I'll just read a brief, brief quote here. A remarkable insight for modern neuroscience is the understanding that we what we express externally reflects hidden internal brain structure or the structure of our inner world. Reality is a construct between the eye and brain, not only the way we live, but specifically the way we choose to build buildings reflects hidden internal brain design that we may not know we carry, yet unconsciously are always responding to. Just like I showed you in the first slides, how your brain is unconsciously responding to a building with or without windows very differently. Um, you, a brain that's been through trauma will unconsciously respond to reality much differently afterwards. So we can now see as Gropius, one of the founding fathers of modern architecture who worked at Harvard from the 30s till 1952, um, who taught people his method, he had PTSD and his architecture is an external expression of his PTSD. So this is a bunker um, on the right and uh, near the Western Front that still survives, they have it. They, they allowed trees to grow up because soldiers from World War I are still, their bodies are still in the ground there. And this is Gropia's house that he built while he was working at Harvard, uh, 20 miles away from the campus. And it kind of looks like a bunker. And then with PTSD, you become dis disembodied as your buildings. I could never understand what was so crazy to me is why modern architecture looks so different than architecture of the past. Uh, for the first 2,000, 3,000 years, architecture is always very similar. And then suddenly with modern architecture, it's different. Well, with PTSD, you become disembodied. Um, the bu this building on the left is directly opposite Gropius's uh, house. Um, and it looks like you can find the front door. You kind of know where you are. You think the building wants to see you. The building on the right, when you visit this building, they tell you a story of a woman coming up after it was built and thinking it, after it was built, thinking it was a gas station. Um, it does, doesn't look like it's a home. Um, and the other thing about PTSD that's so interesting and I think really revealing is when you have PTSD, they certainly saw this with soldiers um, that have served in recent wars in the United, um, overseas in the United States, you lose the ability to take in detail, your vision suffers. So that's why there's so much detail in the house of the left and there's like almost no detail at all here. Your brain can't take it in, um, it stops time. And this is where it's really amazing. <coughs> with PTSD, you keep replaying the trauma subliminally. So here's the trench from World War I trench. And then here's Gropius's study. It's laid out exactly like a trench <coughs> where you can't see out unless you stand up. And then where um, you're, you know, the things that you need are, are, are stored in very um, simple shelving, exactly like in a trench. And then Gropius's bedroom, it's kind of mind blowing. He laid it out just like the bed, the bed areas where the men would sleep in a trench. They slept in a place called a dugout in the trench wall where um, 
there there just be places where men would sleep behind a sturdy door frame. He did the exact same layout in his second floor bedroom. A sturdy door frame and then behind that just his bed. And then uh, when he built a deck, the side facing the street, he covered with a tall wall so no one could see him in it. And then interior wall construction mimics trench construction. Believe it or not, I'm eight miles from a World War I trench that was reconstructed in Hudson, Massachusetts at the American Heritage Foundation. They recently opened it. So you can go experience a World War I trench. When you go in, you see kind of random construction the way it's built, because someone's about to kill you. You're gonna build very quickly and put things kind of in a random way. And you walk into Gropius's house, you know, horizontal, horizontal siding is placed vertically. It's that same kind of, you know, rushed feeling. So modern architecture, a direct expression of trauma of World War I trench. I presented this at a um, medical conference in 2019 and at, at ANFA, that's the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture in 2020. And there's a YouTube video of it. If you just Google the happy.org, you'll see the YouTube video of it. Basically that modern architecture now happens. It doesn't express typical brain architecture. It express, expresses damage to brain architecture. And then briefly, what about Le Corbusier? Uh, Le Corbusier did not serve in World War I. He was too blind. And this is his architecture. It was very powerful in terms of what got built in the 20th century, had a huge impact. But now if you read any, um, any biography of him, they talk about it, Le Corbusier was autistic. And when you're autistic, your face avoided. You don't like looking at faces. And often you're very logical thinkers. Someone once told me that 25% of all professors in engineering schools are on the autism spectrum. You know, so Le Corbusier came up with five points of architecture that I put on the right here. Um, he didn't ask anyone. He did no preference studies. He did no, it wasn't evidence-based. He just came up with it. Um, it, it. It's kind of an engineering thinking. It doesn't understand how human perception actually happens. And the amazing thing though is, this is again, the new age of biology that's mind blowing. You have someone normal look at a kitten, someone in the autism spectrum. Can you tell which is which? Well, the one that they're not looking at the face, right? Exactly right. So that's why it's so amazing that now this technology, they can show this. So in autism, they can now diagnose, I've read, they can now diagnose autism in infants as young as two months by the way they move their eyes. Whereas a neurotypical child without, or adult without conscious control will immediately look at the face. It's, it's really amazing. So what you can see is that, oh, and there's a lot of this on the internet now that you can find how autistic brains see the world differently than neurotypical ones. So that's the big point. Autistic brains, PTSD brains see the world differently. That's why modern architecture looks so different. Okay, so one on the right is autism spectrum, 30 people on the left, neurotypical. Look at the difference. The autistic person looks right at the blank. So that's fascinating, isn't it? That is fascinating. Isn't that amazing? So because it can win, here's what you have to understand. We don't see reality. It's a construct between eye and brain. And now we understand brain architecture. So we can tell modern architecture is a direct expression of atypical brain architecture. It has to be. That's why could we see his architecture looks like this. He can look at that. A neurotypical person cannot. Okay. How did modern architecture happen? Relationally compromised people with atypical fixations. These are subliminal fixations you don't control. Okay. Uh, came up with the approach because the world was wounded, rushing to bury the past. There were all kinds of new technologies and there were economic power structures willing to profit from it. So this is coming out, this came out in a new book, Urban Experience Design. It's in the second edition of Cognitive Architecture. When you discuss architectural history now, you have to talk about modern architecture was the direct result of atypical brain regulation, All right? Impact of World War I, architecture becomes avoidant. It's an external expression of atypical brain structure. All right. So understanding human perception is relational, changes how we assess things helps us understand also though, this is what's so important about it, what we need to see, all right? And so 21st century paradigm shifts helps us really see what people need to see to be at their best. These are all buildings in greater Boston. Most of them are protected by historic bylaws now, but you can understand why people love these buildings, okay? And then the 21st century paradigm shift lets us forecast behavior. We understand subliminal behaviors that we cannot control direct our experience. So this, this I'll just briefly tell you this, this was, I took this in Cincinnati and um, it's the new Zaha Hadid. It was a, an art center there. And basically what happened is people couldn't look at the building, it was too blank. So about um, eight years ago, they put this statue, Metrobot with streaming text and a happy face 
right at the front door. So people would look at the building. You see what they had to do to the architecture? They had to put a Band-Aid on it because the architecture really didn't work. Okay, finally, the learning objectives, we can see the unseen. We can understand unconscious processing outside our conscious control directs our behavior in the built environment. We can see how biometric modeling like eye tracking or facial expression analysis can predict our behavior. And we can learn how evolutionary history presets the human responses to stimuli, how we're hardwired to look for and at faces all the time. And finally, we can appreciate that we are not modern. You can take us out of the stone age, but not the stone age out of us. Okay, briefly, I'll just show um, the, the books that you might want to read. What really got me into this was The Age of Insight by Eric Kandel. He wrote it in 2012. Um, it, it's brilliantly written. Um, this is a new book on marketing by, uh, that just came out in 2020, um, Blindsight. It's all about how um, marketers use the subliminal brain to manipulate us. And then there's my book, the second edition is coming up in, in, in July. Um, Hewing Architecture Planning Institute, I'd love to hear from all of you. Our mission is to promote evidence-based design. We really want to really get people to understand more how humans actually function. Um, we're not cars, we're people, we're animals, and our subliminal brain is guiding our experience. Um, science is real, stay curious. <laughs> and uh, questions, okay? <laughs> we have lots of questions for you, Anne. The chat has been an absolute buzz. Um, so I'm going to kick off with, um, Paul had had a question. Uh, do you consider architecture and the built environment as Richard Dawkins' concept of the extended phenotype? I'm not sure what your question is. <laughs> I don't quite understand it. I mean, I think, well, I think when you start doing this research, you realize we see the world like an animal and um, our biology is preset what we want to see. And that's just, that's just it. And our biology can't change as fast as our technology. Yeah, and that phenotype would be that expression of, of the DNA, right? Right, right. And then, yeah, it is. Basically, I guess then, yeah, yeah the answer would be yes. <laughs> Uh, can you change the way your subliminal brain works? I, I think there are some, some, you know, there is maybe some ways you can change your way your subliminal brain works. And I think there is therapies for PTSD and there are therapies for autism to change how their brains work and you can learn. But in some ways it's very difficult. Like the face bias is not going to change. In addition, um, your body is in a continual state of flow and is always responding to stimuli continually. You're just not con conscious of it. Thank you. Um, can you tell us the name again of that software that was purchased by Apple and, and buried for their own purposes? <laughs> yes, that was um, Facet is the company. And in 2016, they bought it. I was able to use it before 2016. I still have it on my computer. And the, and the software is called Emotient, E-M-O-T-I-E-N-T. And um, it's pretty amazing they did that. But you could see why they did that. The software is extremely powerful and it shows all the way people are feeling before they're maybe even consciously aware they're happy. They'll be able to tell it by the way the face is moving. You know, see, I, I'm sure you've had that experience in your life when you're saying, hey, Nancy, you didn't really like when I said that, did you? And you're saying, no, I didn't, what do you mean? And, and because, because what your face did, I'm sure you've had that experience, you know? I'm pretty, I have, I have a, not a very good poker face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but people are reading you subliminally all the time. That is very true. Very true. Uh, Patrick has a question. Has there been any experiment done or data on whether people look at uh, maybe dependent on one culture you know, where they grew up or to experience the person's life experiences and what they're exposed to or age group or profession? Those are super good questions. And basically here's the deal. Um, this is what's real. It's really fascinating and tremendously scary. Basically the first three to five seconds when you look at something at a glance, it doesn't matter your age, gender, religion, language, you look at it the same way. I was a 3M Bass scientist explained this to me and you look at it a lot like, I hope you're ready for this guys, like a monkey, okay? And then after that, when consciousness kicks, kicks in, that's when, when, you know, that's when age, um, biases, culture start picking up. But the immediate 
thing is completely animal. We look at it, and in a way, it kind of it kind of makes sense. Um, um, you know, I don't think cars change their headlight arrangements that much when they sail in different countries. Oh, you gotta see in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, another question, I think you started to answer this already in your last question, but how does age play a part in tracking, you know, for instance, do senior citizens focus on one area as opposed to a younger person? Yeah, I, I think, I think there, again, I think, um, the first apparent, according to the science, the vision scientists at 3M, the first at a glance, the first three to five seconds or so, it doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter. But then definitely after that age and culture does matter. So age and culture can de definitely matter. Um, Great, thank you. Um, do you have any data about night? Uh, Lindsay is an architectural lighting designer and curious about these concepts as related to the nighttime environment. Um, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I, I, that's a super good question. I think that the issue is when you're dealing with neuroscience and all these ideas, it's like drinking out of a fire hose, too much is coming at you. So um, I think what you have to do, what I wanted to really focus on was daytime and the public realm. Why is it easy to walk in Paris? Why is it not so easy to walk in suburban America? I couldn't understand why. And this science actually has answered that question. It's because the subliminal brain is not fed the fixations it needs to keep itself soothed. Um, it, it, it's a real problem having an old brain. <laughs> <laughs> All that knowledge rolling around in there. <laughs> Yeah, it's a real problem, but our brain is still, we're still animals and we're still responding to the same thing. Yeah. Uh, did anyone test how architects and architectural historians look at buildings? Yeah, that's been tested. And basically, if you go to architecture school, that apparently um, kind of changes your brain and you don't look at the world anymore like a normal person. <laughs> so actually, when they do these studies, they want to know, they want to separate out the architects from the non architects because going to architecture school. And then the funny thing is that when the end of the day, I would argue that you want to design for regular people because architects are what 0.0001% of the population. You want to design for the normal brain. And that and when you go through architecture school, you stop seeing the world like a normal person, <laughs> especially when you're taught modern architecture, which was made up by people who couldn't see the world normally because they were so traumatized. I think what's fascinating and what's so new is understanding how trauma really impacts the brain. And it really does. So if you've been traumatized, um, it will subliminally, you won't even know it's impacting you, but it's still impacting you because the reality is always a construct between your eye and your brain and you don't even know what your brain has in it half the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right you know. um, so Anna had a question about art. You know, it would be interesting to use eye tracking software to see how viewers actually see a particular painting. Do you have any examples of that? Yeah, I do actually, you wanna see them? <laughs> I actually have, I, I track some Picassos and um, it was really, really fascinating. Um, and um, what's real, it's really, really interesting. I mean, I don't know if you want me to share my screen, but I could show it to you that, that Picasso figured out that if he did a painting of a young girl with really distorted eyes, people would really look at it and, and really focus on it. And he was right. And, and if you do a painting with only one eye instead of two, people won't look at it as much. But eye tracking art's really, really interesting. And what's really interesting too is the, um, I, there are websites about the most viewed paintings of the world that you can find. And most of them, seven or eight of 10, they always show, they tend to show people. Like the Mona Lisa is the most viewed painting. Um, the picture of the woman on the book by Eric Kandel. I mean, often famous paintings have people in them. Although there are some abstract paintings too, but those, those are usually fractals. That's a whole nother topic, but. Oh yeah, yeah, people like, <laughs> absolutely. People don't like blankness, but that's a good topic. It'd be, I think it's a great subject for a book. Eye tracking art would be fascinating. Or a Twitter conversation. Yeah, more Twitter. <laughs> Um, so Bella uh, was asking, so are we going to see a trend of architects equating attention with approachability? Are the things our eyes linger on better for our cities and health? I would argue that's a really super good question. I would argue yes. So because we're a social, social species, we're hardwired for attachment. 
And if we can attach, our nervous system can't calm down. So those old, I showed you pictures of like those charming buildings in, um, in Amsterdam. And even one of your slides before we started showed those charming buildings in Amsterdam. It was really interesting. That was kind of funny. So yeah, we need, we actually, it's kind of just like, when you really think about it though, it all makes sense. Just like nature's preset your heart rate before you're born. She's preset how many times you're gonna breathe in a minute before you're born. She's basically set what your walking pace is gonna be. It's all kind of preset by evolution. Nature has also preset what we need to see. And so we need buildings that suggest people that look like us, that have vertical bilateral symmetry, that have a top, middle and bottom, um, that have windows that could be seen as eyes very quickly. That's basically what it's gonna be because that's how our nervous system is hardwired. Remember, this is what you have to remember that's really important. Buildings are really recent. So if humans are maybe 120,000 years old, but buildings are only like 5,000 years old. So like, our, the nervous system we have evolved without buildings. You get it? So we kind of have to have buildings that look like us for us to feel comfortable in the public realm they create. Otherwise, what happens is people get in their cars and cars are like envelopes. They seal you in your own little tube and you, you're not in the public realm anymore. You're in your own little tube and that's not healthy. <laughs> Right. Well, which a lot of us experienced right over the last year with not being together uh, in with the pandemic. Um, Ronan was, had a question. Uh, is this topic something that is not talked about much? Because now that we understand the marketing methods of large companies, we won't purchase those items. Or is this addictive and we as humans cannot stop it even if we want to? Yeah, I think the companies are very, very smart. You know, Apple hires PhD neuroscientists. They get it. They're very, very smart. They're designing all of our subliminal brain to manipulate us, and they're very, very smart. <laughs> and I bet that they spend a lot of money on marketing. Yeah, and, and, and the concern is who's designing the public realm that we really need? Who's designing safe walking places? You know, yeah, absolutely. Who's designing city halls that you really want to walk into, and that's the, that that's the scary part, I think. I found that interesting with the library that the library was a public space, but being all glass, it was something that we kind of passed over with our eyes. It's exactly and, what it is because the architects. That's the problem because the architects don't study biology. You know, um, that's the issue. So um, they need to study biology just like the car companies do. Uh, seems like Gropius's home and studio were designed defensively. Unclear entrance and small windows. Is that seeking uh, a feeling of security? Yeah, uh, believe it or not, I, I presented this sli these slides to a Harvard Medical School professor and to professors at trauma schools, and they all said it is the brain wants security and safety. That's what it is. They said it's classic PTSD. That you, they could tell because they study PTSD, they understand what happens. So your your brain is subliminally always looking to feel safe. Um, oh, that makes sense. That's what happens. That's what happens. And they don't even realize it. What's so funny is they don't even realize he was doing it. You're not. He's not consciously doing it. Um, it's fascinating how it works. Uh, what is the thinking as in the end of upside down thinking that brains are sending receiving units that there is solely one mind similar to David Baum's thinking? That sounds fascinating. <laughs> so that's from Lynn. So if Lynn, if you have any clarification on that, that you want to pop in the chat, that would be great. Um, Marcia says she can't remember if Frank Lloyd Wright served. I'm uh, going to say no. Frank Lloyd the... Wright was from a different generation. He was from an earlier generation, so okay. he he was born I don't know 20 years earlier. So he was a completely different generation, and he did not have PTSD. And he was very upset with the way they were building, and he thought something was wrong with it. And he was right, and um, and his buildings. I mean, he, he he does have some unusual modern buildings, but his buildings tend to have a top, middle, and bottom. They're, they have a sense of narrative coherence um, and they're not so, um, they fit in a way, the way that um, the modern buildings do not. What happens with modern built environments is they become very disjointed. It's actually fascinating. They become really, really disjointed because the people creating them were disjointed inside. 
I could never understand why traditional old towns, they're so coherent. You can walk right through, it all makes sense. Whereas modernism is never coherent. It's, it's ramsh, it doesn't make any sense because well, the people came up, who came up with it didn't have a coherent sense inside them. Remember reality is a construct between eye and brain. So you're seeing it's, it, the art, what, what trauma therapists talk about is dissociation. So they, they gave us their dissociation. There's this great quote from Bessel van der Kolk, the famous trauma doctor, hurt people hurt other, uh, hurt other people. That's what happened in modern architecture. And that's what, you know, because it doesn't feed us what we need. <laughs> right. Uh, Sharon says Gropius's pre-war building looks the same than his post-war post -war buildings. How would PTSD explain that? Well, I think it, it, it doesn't quite look the same. It has a top, middle, and bottom. I've looked at the Fagan and stuff. It doesn't quite look the same. It's not as blank. It has a top, middle, bottom. The, the front doors are right there. It's not, it's not the same as architecture changed. I think what happened, the architects at, at the turn of the century and in the early 20th century were really trying to incorporate engineering thinking. You know? And so I think that's what the, his early structures look like. But then when you, once you have PTSD, you can really incorporate engineering thinking because you're, you're more dissociated. You don't understand how people think. So there is a real difference. The front doors of his uh, pre-war uh, pre buildings are easier to find than the front doors of anything he built afterwards. PTSD grabs hold of you and doesn't let go. Yeah, but the, the way that it alters your the actual brain. It, yeah, yeah. And remember, reality is a construct between your eye and your brain. You don't see reality. Um, have you done any studies with people uh, experienced with meditation? No, those are really important studies. The people who are really doing this. There's a trauma research association. Um, the, the Bessel van der Kolk guy, he, he talks about that. There's trauma and, and they do meditation for PTSD. They do play acting. Um, they do art. They, they do amazing things to try to um, soothe the traumatized brains. And there are definitely all kinds of therapies around that weren't available. Uh, when the modern art, the fathers of modern architecture were living. Um, so with modern architecture, um, you know, we had two or three people kind of anchoring that that were influenced by trauma. But what about the, uh, all of the architects and people who followed their theories after that? Yeah, that's really, really interesting too. I mean, why did they just take hold? I mean, I think they, it just kind of changed. There was a need to rebuild that was fantastic. And then the problem after World War I, you had World War II, which even more death and, and trauma and, and need to rebuild and not understanding what traditional people, traditional architecture gave people. Um, that was the issue, they didn't understand. And then it was cheaper to build often um, in, the, in the new modern way. You didn't need the craftsmen. It was kind of cheaper to build in a way if you could think of industrial thinking. But they didn't understand that, wait a minute, that's not how humans are wired to see things. Um, um, so how does this theory about the animal brain relate to modern art? I, I think it, I think it definitely, I think it certainly, I think modern art also can, th th there have been books written about that. Modern art also reflects some of the, the trauma and dissociation because the industrialized world just changed so quickly. The wars happened, you know, just these fantastic wars for the first 40 years of the 20th century. And just, it just turned everything upside down. And I think modern art reflects some of that. I think Picasso's work reflects some of that. Um, but at the same time, Picasso's work always has faces in it, you know? <laughs> he got yeah. it, he knew what people needed to see. Um, Megan was saying she could see how this could influence planning and shaping of public spaces. But she's curious if you can talk a little bit more about how this could be applied to communities and neighborhoods at large. Well, I, I think it's really, there's this famous um, idea in, in, I think, um, philosophy, but also in science, that you can't solve a problem unless you ask the right question, or you can't get the right answer unless you ask the right question. Because it turns out questions are embedded in the answer. So if your question of the way you're framing the um, new neighborhood or the new school doesn't understand that humans are animals, they have subliminal things driving them, they need to see faces, they go for edge conditions that are consistent, they love detail, um, th then you're not going to get the right answer. 
Um, that's the problem. You know, questions and answers are embedded. Humans are not machines. Um, in America, one of the problems we've had, we've built a lot of our towns around cars. And that's kind of a problem because people don't walk like cars, you know? Right. Absolutely. Um, do you find common ground between your work and Christopher Alexander's? There, oh, there are people who talk to me. There's Nico Salangaros, a professor um, at the University of Texas, San Antonio, who often talks to me about Salangaros and how Salangaros kind of, uh, how, how Christopher Alexander kind of, um, kind of predicted some of this. I think he understood it without ever having access to the biometric tools because a lot of these tools just weren't available when he was doing his work. Uh, J.J. Gibson wrote a book called The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. In it, he coined the concept of affordances. Do you deal with this concept much? Affordances are really important. We do talk about in the cognitive architecture, we talk about edge conditions and affordances are about edge conditions. So it turns out humans, one of the things we do, the secret things are doing, we're always looking for faces without realizing it. We're also subliminally always looking for secure edge conditions. Um, we're, we're called the thigmatactic species. So just like uh, mice, um, just like most mammals of prey, we're thigmatactic without even knowing why. We'll, uh, we'll walk along an edge condition. We'll sit, look, I'm sitting with my back against the wall. Um, it's really, really interesting. And even in Disneyland Main Street where there are no cars, people walk, they tend never to walk in the center of the street. Even though there are no cars, they'll walk at the, at the, at the edge conditions. It's, it's just how the brain works to secure, so it's a survival and um, a survival strategy, basically. Great, thank you. Um, do you think that architecture will revert back to the older form and make use of faces or has this already started to happen? That's a really good question. I think, I think the thing is in some ways, buildings are so expensive. Architects have much less control than you'd hope. So I'm hoping that the public can really make public health and human well-being a priority and then maybe get this science incorporated into how we frame our communities. It's a really good question. I mean, because we've been building the wrong way for about a century. And so we need to revert back. And we've been too car centric, which really is unhealthy. I'm very concerned, I'm a mom. I'm very concerned that Americans are now, you should all know this, 46th in longevity on the World Health Organization charge. We're 46th. That means 45 other countries, people live longer. A uh, retired surgeon explained to me 70% of Americans are overweight, 40% are obese. Um, one of the reasons we have the, the, the longevity issues in this country now is because of the obesity. We aren't designing the world we need to live in. And um, that's a real concern. And I think understanding people better will can help that with your help. <laughs> Working together. Um, why are some buildings designed without build without windows? Um, that's a really good question. I think it's cheaper. Um, you know, I think often you know it, it takes a lot of money to build, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, and and it just it's cheaper to do. And there was this sense, I think, after World War II, particularly, we wanted to be modern. We wanted to put everyone in cars. Oh, we'll put DDT in the crops. We'll make everything plastic. Uh, we'll tell mothers not to nurse their babies because it's primitive. I mean, we had all these ideas, which when you really start thinking about the ecosystem we're part of actually don't make sense. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, we had a comment that modern design is calming to me, ornate architecture stresses me out. Is this common? It could be, but I would argue we'll have to see that, uh, you know, it depends. We have to see, you know, it'd be interesting to check that out, um, take you in certain places, see where you go. If Disneyland Main Street had all modern buildings, people wouldn't walk up it. The brain wouldn't let them. Because the subliminal, what happens is a subliminal brain that you don't control makes the fixations on the, on the diverse elements that it sees the contrasting elements, and then that pulls you forward without your awareness. Because walking is done with automaticity. Automaticity means automatically without thinking about it. So if the Disneyland Main Street were all glass plate glass, nobody would walk down it. We can't. <laughs> 
Um, I, we have another, we've got lots of great questions, which is wonderful. Um, talking about uh, our World War I uh, architecture vets, um, why did other architects mimic those designs um, versus trying to look at something different? Well, I, I think, again, it was part of the new ethos of the new world, the world of plastics, of formula for babies, of everybody in a car, this idea that engineering and war, because war gave us our world. There's a new best-selling New York Times book about that. We're really living in the, and Tom Hanks wrote, a, wrote an article about that in New York Times recently. It's the 75th year after the end of World War II. You know, war gave us our world, and we were just so entranced by the technologies, we just kind of took them all in. What was the question again? Um, I forget. But, Just so you know how they're, why would they mimic? Um, why they know, essentially, and the other yeah. thing is, I think what happens too is, it, this is a really interesting idea. There's also a lot of gaslighting that with someone, gaslighting is a term when um, people are telling you something that's not, you know, that, that humans learn by being mirrored. And these people who were teaching who had PTSD didn't mirror the right way, they couldn't. Um, they didn't tell, and when I went to architecture school, traditional architecture was never mentioned. So I assumed, well, I guess it's never important. But then why do, does Disneyland all have traditional architecture? Why does everyone go to Venice? It makes no sense. Um, when people have pictures of Paris, you think there are no modern buildings in Paris. Why is that? Something didn't make sense. And because in a way you're gaslit to tell you that traditional architecture didn't matter anymore. But in a way you have to have compassion. World War I and World War II were so horrible, people didn't want to look at the past. They wanted to throw it out and they wanted, they had this idea they could start from scratch. And, and, and Gropius would say to a student, we're starting from zero. Well, that's PTSD because great architecture is always evidence-based. That's why it worked. I like that. Um, how are you differentiating correlation and causality here? Couldn't there be alternate explanations for why we fixate on windows or how we can diagnose early modernists? No, I, I, no nature doesn't work that way. <laughs> it, I, it just doesn't, see, the struggle for survival is so intense. Things have to be pretty much preset. Just like their, your, your heart rate is going to more or less be preset, your breath rate is more or less going to be preset, how you're going to foot, put one foot after another, there's going to be some range is more or less preset. What you need to look at, how your eyes are going to move is more or less preset. Now, the major thing your brain is doing is vision. Vision takes huge amounts of energy and more of your blood flow goes to your brain than any other organ. Um, it's all really interesting. Um, so, and it, the brain is hugely complex. But, uh, it's all basically preset. And I think, I think what we didn't understand in the 20th century and what we're struggling with now with climate change is we're in a closed system. It's a system, it's a very complicated system. And to really design, we have to, we're part of the system, we're of the system. Um, and to design better, we have to um, acknowledge that. I tell my students, you know, now with DNA, we now know that they share 86% of the same DNA as a zebrafish. Who knew? <laughs> you know, you're 80, or, or a zebrafish is 86% human. And you sell 99 or 98% with a chimpanzee. I mean, it's a whole different way. Oh, and it's even more funny, you share 15% share of the DNA with mustard grass. Who knew? I never thought, I presume grass and people were completely different. Think again. It's not, we're part of a closed system that's been interacting for millions of years and we're not modern. Um, could you please discuss from a neuroscience point of view, how the brain is working during attachment or without it? I'm not sure, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I can say is the human brain is hardwired for attachment. We need to have attachment. Um, and um, we, we, we just, we're, we're built for attachment and we're built for having others see us to help us see ourselves. We need to attach to other people and we need to attach to buildings um, to be, feel safe and secure. One of the problems of the design of the human brain is it has something called the amygdala and that's kind of like a fear-based system in the brain. It's, it's kind of in the primitive part of the brain. And basically that's gonna go on alert without conscious awareness and get you jumping into a car 
or get you running down the street without you even knowing what you saw. I'm sure if you've been driving, sometimes you've moved and say, hey, I didn't even see that car coming and I've already moved away. Or you were walking, and you suddenly jumped on a sidewalk. I didn't see that, that person coming, but I've already jumped on the sidewalk. How did that happen? Your brain subliminally told you to do it. But the human brain, the architecture of the human brain, one could argue is fear-based. And so that's why we need Disneyland to have all those ridiculously ornate buildings, 52 of them, one different than the other because that soothes the brain to make you feel like you're safe. And then plus Disney did something very smart. He took all the cars off the street. I'm not sure yeah. that's the question, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that you, you got it. We have a, a comment here um, from Brid Ryan. Prince Charles designed housing schemes in the UK in the late eighties, which tried to mimic designs of the past with the twee little windows and the pitched roofs. Uh, the urban layout copied medieval street layouts. Despite this, they were architecturally very poor, a uh, little more than a pistache. And from an urban point of view, they have been failures. Do you have a comment on that? Well, I've been to one of Prince Charles's things that he did, Poundbury, and that was amazing. It was absolutely fantastic. You couldn't, didn't, it felt timeless. I felt safe walking there. I didn't know the place at all. Poundbury was absolutely great. And there's um, new buildings that I've seen that have been gone up in the past two years, and they're also fantastic. Um, I think the Prince Charles intuited, basically he did evidence-based design. He went and looked at places where people like to be. And um, what you find in Massachusetts generally is if something has historic district designation, it sells for like 20% more than things that do not. And in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the highest real estate in the Commonwealth per capita is in Nantucket Island. That was an old whaling town. And that became all, the whole island basically is under historic designation. They banned modern architecture in 1960s or something. You cannot build a modern building. Now only ultra millionaires live there. They have beautiful cobblestone streets. It's you feel really cozy walking down those streets. It's, it's kind of amazing what's happened. So modern architecture is for the, the wealthy in Massachusetts get the the most beautiful old architecture. That's what happens when a class thing. Yeah, that's unfortunate. <clears throat> They're very pretty to look at though. Um, yeah. How do you think that the pandemic uh, sh will shift the future of architecture? I hope it gives us a chance to really understand that biology is real because in a way the pandemic is all about, um, you know, invisible things are there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't see a virus, but it's changing our life. And in a way, this lecture is about the same thing. You can't see those fixations I just showed you, but they're there and they're driving you anyway. Um, so I, I hope that biology is part of the humanities. And I hope that the pandemic gets people to see that, right? <laughs> it's all human. <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, what about the mothers of modern architecture? Who are they and is their work vastly different? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I think in a way this idea of fathers of modern architecture, I took this from the his history books, right? And, <laughs> and that's, those are the things that architecture students are taught. What they haven't been taught until recently, and this is really basically this year, that they were, they were all had brain disorders. And that changes how you look at them because those men had incredible power. They really did. Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, Le Corbusier. Um, in in, in uh, California, there was Neutra, Richard Neutra. He was also World War I vet. Uh, <laughs> they had incredible power at that time. And I think our, our society since then, women are gaining more power, definitely. I mean, we have a female vice president. What do you know? <laughs> All right, and I think we've had so many wonderful questions. I think we're going to wrap it up with this. What is on the horizon for you, Anne, besides your book coming out in July? What kind of question is that? Oh, well, I'd love to do, with Nancy's help, I'd love to do, I really love getting science out there. And I'd love to do a PBS series. Carl Sagan did a famous one, you know. Um, and I'd love to do a PBS series about like the science of the human body and how it really matters and how we can't just have advertisers know about it. We can't just have car companies understanding our subliminal brain. We have to have everybody understanding it. And especially the people building our schools and our streets and our crosswalks. And so there's just this opportunity, I think, 
in, in a way because of the pandemic to try to get like maybe a PBS series or to try to get more people educated about how they work um, and to and to be and to have compassion for our, our history. Well, that sounds great. I, I look forward to working on that with you. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. We have to do it. I mean, it's really exciting. And some of the tech tools that are out there are mind blowing and we need to look into it. <laughs> It absolutely is. It absolutely is. Thank you, Anne. This has been really wonderful. To find out more information about Anne's work, you can visit her blog. That's geneticsofdesign.com. And the link is in the chat. Also, Anne Sussman's website, which is annsussman.com. And I'll be following up with an email with some of that information as well. If you enjoyed this, our next Science Pub is on May 11th at 7 p.m. Uh, guest host Jessica Wow will be taking you through an exciting talk from Nick Buss on frogs, frozen roads, and human safety, keeping animals and humans safe through the seasons. So Nick is going to be talking about his research. Christine has put the link for May Science Pub in the chat, so please do go ahead and RSVP for that right now while you are thinking of it. I want to thank Ian Sussman for your time and expertise. This was an absolutely fascinating talk. I know there was a lot of chat going on over on the side. So I think a lot of people were really engaged. So thank you. Thank you so much. This is being recorded and it will be available on WSKG YouTube in our Science Pub playlist. And I want to thank Christine Kiesler, uh, Julia Diana, Jessica Waugh, Alyssa Micha, who is our director and producer for this evening. WSKG Public Media, and I'd like to thank you for spending the evening with us and attending tonight's Science Pub. If you liked us, be sure to visit Facebook for future events at Science Pub Bing, and you can find us at WSKG's website as well, which is WSKG.org. I'm your host, Nancy Coddington. Thank you very much, and have a good night.